afternoon. Earlier today, I was briefed by our senior military and national security leaders on the status of the drawdown of U.S. forces and allied forces in Afghanistan. When I announced our drawdown in April, I said we would be uh, out by September, and we're on track to meet that target. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our military mission in Afghanistan will conclude on August 31st. The drawdown is proceeding in a secure and orderly way, prioritizing the safety of our troops as they depart. Our military commanders advised me that once I made the decision to end the war, we needed to move swiftly to conduct the main elements of the drawdown. And in this context, speed is safety. And uh, thanks to the way in which we have managed our withdrawal, no one, no one U.S. forces or any forces have, uh, have been lost. Conducting our drawdown differently would have certainly come with an increased risk of safety to our personnel. To me, those risks were unacceptable. And there was never any doubt that our military would perform this task efficiently and with the highest level of professionalism. That's what they do. And the same is true of our NATO allies and partners who have supported, we are supporting and supporting us as well as they conclude their retrograde. I want to be clear, the U.S. military mission in Afghanistan continues through the end of August. We remain, we retain personnel and, ca and capacities in the country, and we maintain some authority, to, excuse me, the same authority under which we've been operating for some time. As I said in April, the United States did what we went to do in Afghanistan, to get the terrorists to attack us on 9-11 and deliver justice to Osama bin Laden and to degrade the terrorist threat to keep Afghanistan from becoming a base from which attacks could be continued against the United States. We achieved those objectives. That's why we went. We did not go to Afghanistan to nation build. And it's the right and the responsibility of the Afghan people alone to decide their future and how they want to run their country. Together, with our NATO allies and partners, we have trained and equipped over three, nearly 300,000 current serving members of the military, the Afghan National Security Force, and many beyond that who are no longer serving. Add to that, hundreds of thousands more Afghan National Defense and Security Forces trained over the last two decades. We provided our Afghan partners with all the tools, let me emphasize, all the tools, training and equipment of any modern military. We provided advanced weaponry, and we're going to continue to provide funding and equipment. And we'll ensure they have the capacity to maintain their Air Force. But most critically, as I stressed in my meeting just two weeks ago with President Ghani and Chairman Abdullah, Afghan leaders have to come together and drive toward a future that the Afghan people want and they deserve. In our meeting, I also assured Ghani that U.S. support for the people of Afghanistan will endure. We will continue to provide civilian and humanitarian assistance, including speaking out for the rights of women and girls. I intend to maintain our diplomatic presence in Afghanistan, and we are coordinating closely with our international partners in order to continue to secure the international airport. And we're going to engage in a determined diplomacy to pursue peace and a peace agreement that will end this senseless violence. I've asked Secretary of State Blinken and our Special Representative for Afghanistan Reconciliation to work vigorously with the parties in Afghanistan, as well as the regional and international stakeholders to support a negotiated solution. To be clear, to be clear, countries in the region have an essential role to play in supporting a peaceful settlement. We'll work with them, and they should help step up their efforts as well. We're going to continue to work for the release of detained Americans, including uh, Mark, uh, uh, excuse me, Ferrix. I, I want to pronounce the name correctly. I, mis I misspoke. So that he can return to his family safely. We're also going to continue to make sure that we take on the uh, Afghan nationals who work side by side with U.S. forces, including interpreters and translators, since we're no longer going to have military there after this. We're not going to need them, and they have, have no jobs. We're also going to be vital to our efforts, so they, and they've been very vital, and so their families are not exposed to danger as well. 
We've already dramatically accelerated the procedure uh, time for special immigrant visas to bring them to the United States. Since I was inaugurated on January 20th, we've already approved 2,500 special immigrant visas to come to the United States. Up to now, fewer than half have exercised their right to do that. Half have gotten on aircraft and come, commercial flights and come, and other half believe they want to stay, at least thus far. We're working closely with Congress to change the authorization legislation so that we can streamline the process of approving those visas. And those who have stood up for the operation to physically relocate thousands of Afghans and their families before the U.S. military mission concludes so that if they choose, they can wait safely outside of Afghanistan while their U.S. visas are being processed. The operation has uh, identified U.S. facilities outside of the continental United States, as well as in third countries, to host our Afghan allies if they, choose, if they so choose. And this, uh, starting this month, we're going to begin to re, re, reloc we're going to be begin relocation flights for Afghanistan SIV applicants uh, uh, and their families who choose to leave. We have a point person in the White House and at the State Department-led task force coordinating all of these efforts. But our message to those women and men is clear. There is a home for you in the United States if you so choose, and we will stand with you just as you stood with us. When I made the decision to end the U.S. military involvement in Afghanistan, I judged that it was not in the national interest of the United States of America to continue fighting this war indefinitely. I made the decision with clear eyes, and I'm briefed daily on the battlefield updates. But for those who have argued that we should stay just six more months or just one more year, I ask them to consider the lessons of recent history. In 2011, the NATO allies and partners agreed that we would end our combat mission in 2014. In 2014, some argued one more year. So we kept fighting. And we kept taking casualties. In 2015, the same, and on and on. Nearly 20 years of experience has shown us that the current security situation only confirms that just one more year of fighting in Afghanistan is not a solution but a recipe for being there indefinitely. It's up to the Afghans to make the decision about the future of their country. Others are more direct. Their argument is that we should stay with the Afghan in Afghanistan indefinitely. In doing so, they point to the fact that we, uh, we have not taken losses in this last year. So they claim that the cost of just maintaining the status quo is minimal. But that ignores the reality and the facts that already presented on the ground in Afghanistan when I took office. The Taliban was at its strongest is at its strongest militarily since 2001. The number of U.S. forces in Afghanistan had been reduced to a bare minimum. And the United States and the last administration made an agreement that they, to, with the Taliban to remove all our forces by May 1 of this, past, of this year. That's what I inherited. That agreement was the reason the Taliban had ceased major attacks against U.S. forces. If in April I had instead announced that the United States was going to back, going back on that agreement made by the last administration, the United States and allied forces would remain in Afghanistan for, for the foreseeable future, the Taliban would have again begun to target our forces. The status quo was not an option. Staying would have meant U.S. troops taking casualties. American men and women back in the middle of a civil war. And we would run the risk of having to send more troops back into Afghanistan to defend our remaining troops. Once that agreement with the Taliban had been made, staying with a bare minimum force was no longer possible. So let me ask those who want us to stay, how many more, how many thousands more Americans' daughters and sons were you willing to risk? How long would you have them stay? Already we have members of our military whose parents fought in Afghanistan 20 years ago. Would you send their children and their grandchildren as well? Would you send your own son or daughter? After 20 years, a trillion dollars spent training and equipping hundreds of thousands of Afghan national security and defense forces. 2,448 Americans killed, 
20,722 more wounded and untold thousands coming home with unseen trauma to their mental health. I will not send another generation of Americans to war in Afghanistan with no reasonable expectation of achieving a different outcome. The United States cannot afford to remain tethered to policies, creating a response to a world as it was 20 years ago. We need to meet the threats where they are today. Today, the terrorist threat has metastasized beyond Afghanistan. So, we are repositioning our resources and adapting our counterterrorism posture to meet the threats where they are now, significantly higher in South Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. But make no mistake, our military and intelligence leaders are confident they have the capabilities to protect the homeland and our interests from any resurgent terrorist challenge emerging or emanating from Afghanistan. We are developing a counterterrorism over the horizon capability that will allow us to keep our eyes firmly fixed and any direct threats to the United States and the region and act quickly and decisively if needed. We also need to focus on shoring up America's core strengths to meet the, the strategic comp competition with China and other nations that is really going to determine, determine our future. We have to defeat COVID-19 at home and around the world. Make sure we're better prepared for the next pandemic or biological threat. We need to establish international norms for cyberspace and the use of emerging technologies. We need to take concerted action to fight existential threats of climate change. And we will be more formidable to our adversaries and competitors over the long run if we fight the battles of the next 20 years, not the last 20 years. Finally, I want to recognize the incredible sacrifice and dedication that the U.S. military and civilian personnel serving alongside our allies and partners have made over the last two decades in Afghanistan. I want to honor the significance of what they've accomplished and the great personal risk they encountered and the incredible cost to their families. Pursuing the terrorist threat through some of the most unforgiving terrain on the planet. I've been almost throughout that entire country. Ensuring there hasn't been another attack on the homeland from Afghanistan for the last 20 years. Taking out bin Laden. I want to thank you all for your service and the, and the dedication to the mission so many of you have given. And to the sacrifices that you and your families have made over the long course of this war. We'll never forget those who gave the last full measure of devotion for their country in Afghanistan, nor those whose lives have been immeasurably altered by wounds sustained in the service of their country. We're ending America's longest war, but we'll always, always honor the bravery of the American patriots who served in it. May God bless you all, and may God protect our troops. Thank you.